McDonald's. Mr. Mr. Ken McDonald. All right, so this next item is something we need for this committee, and we need you to make a decision. So be ready. <laughs> okay, we're not, we haven't been very good at that, but we'll try. Yeah, so. Okay. All right. Stretch your wings a little. Okay. So, so what I'm here to talk about today is a, a protocol for genetic augmentation. Um, the focus being augmentation of bears from the NCDE to the Yellowstone. Um, kind of the impetus for this was uh, we talked about in the past when the when the uh, Yellowstone D listing was thrown out by the Ports, they identified three different uh, weaknesses, and one of those weaknesses was um, lack of genetic connectivity. So the um, states in, in developing our tri-state MOU and how we're going to manage bears in Yellowstone post delisting um, included a commitment to facilitate um, movement of bears. I uh, you know, physically catch them, truck them if needed to be you know, like allow for augmentation. So we've made a, the states have made a commitment to do that to try and address the judges and finding that they're that short term. Is that just for Yellowstone or that would go for all for N NCDE? And right now, uh, what I'm going to talk about is just, just Yellowstone. Bears into Yellowstone. Okay. So, so they, um, you know, it sounds like a simple thing. You just catch a bear and throw in a truck to move it, um, but not quite that simple. So, so we had uh, Rich Harris, who was working for Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, um, kind of lead an effort with a, a subset of the interagency grizzly bear study team to develop, uh, kind of look at, you know, what what would sort of be the best practices, uh, consideration to take into account in that um, if we're going to do this. And so that resulted in, in the uh, preparation of those two different documents that that I believe Rich um, presented uh, to this group last spring, right? Not to the executive. Or not to say, okay, presented to the NCDB and the, and the GYE subcommittees. Um, we, uh, we had some time to look at those, and uh, our, our hope is that. Um, with the approval of those two subcommittees, we bring it to this group since, since it covers multiple uh, jurisdiction subcommittees and can get the blessing of IGBC to approve this, this document. So I sent that to David um, a week or two ago, so you all should have had it. Um, we presented it to both the, in the last uh, couple of weeks, the, the Yes Committee and the NCDE Committee, um, both of those committees approved moving this forward for this group for your approval. Um, the documents you have are, are, it's not the final finished polished document, but um, it's close. Well, and there's still opportunity for the, some polishing. Um, so we're not looking for big concept discussions, uh, more of a just get it in the final form. And then with your approval, our, our recommendation would be a, 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 a Included as an appendix to both the Yellowstone and the NCG conservation strategies. Um, a little bit about it. Uh, there, again, that's a it's a document that that's a, is really guidelines and considerations. Um, it doesn't commit um, any any entity or any um, timeline to move move bears or um, accept bears, things like that. But but. It's set up so that if there's a desire to move bears for genetic augmentation, these are the things we would consider. These are some of the, the um, sideboards around that. And again, just, just to make sure we're all thinking about all of these different nuances that are involved with the area that physically move bears. The, um, I'll just read on the bottom of page two here, main sentence here, it says, this working document is intended to guide field practitioners and to inform wildlife managers, land managers, and the interested public regarding our collected expertise and best practices likely to result in success. 
Um, so that in a nutshell is what it is. It has um, a, a section, for example, on permissions. And one of the one of the permissions is um, we wouldn't move theirs um, to a place without the permission of the landowner. The landowner likely to be the Forest Service or the Park Service probably. Um, and assume in that as well that the state is receiving it. So so everybody's on board. Um, there's there's uh, considerations for uh, what kind of area you would move, when you would move it, and things like that. Um, so one of the one of the things that the the technical folks are pretty strong about was we're not going to move a conflict there to another ecosystem for this genetic augmentation. So so that that was a real strong advocacy. Uh, there's timing of year. You know, we had the bear last fall. People at my age said, well, let's just send it to Wyoming right now. And <laughs> Wyoming said, wait a minute, you don't move bears into a new area, you know, right before they're ready to start cleaning up. So this has recommendations on what to consider when you're doing these bears. Um, so it's 13 pages, right? Is that the document I should be? Yeah. Okay. Does everybody have it or anybody need it? It's on the website. It's link, it's, uh, there's a, a, a hyperlink in the agenda. Okay. That's yeah. what I just pulled up. So it works. I thought you all read it. So anyway, that in a nutshell is what this is. Uh, it doesn't commit us to moving bears, but it gives us the direction, guidelines, considerations for if there's a desire to do so on things we need. Keep in mind and consider and things like that. So, um, what I'm looking for ideally is, is the blessing of the of this committee, the executive committee, to um, on the concept and to, to finalize this document. I've got a few edits, like after the NCD meeting, that that are not substantive edits. It's mainly just to clean it up some, and uh, would continue to do that to get it a final format. If you trust me to do that. So he's got a question. So yeah. just to clarify, I can't thank you uh, for this. This is about genetic augmentation, not about reintroduction. As right. we, okay. And this is to me one of part of the that came with the lawsuit, right? And so this would set us up for being able to respond or show uh, that we could take that piece away from the concern. That's our yes. Okay. And that it done. I know we talked about this at yes too. That it doesn't um, preclude the possibility of the natural uh, movement. Movement. It's just in addition to. Yeah. Yeah. To give that assurance of. There's a mechanism to do yeah. it. If, if you, yeah. Well, it makes sense to me. Um, if somebody would want to make a motion, I'll make a motion. Okay. So anyone second? Also, you want to do the yeah. nays, nays? <laughs> you can do that or you can do it, see if there's any opposed. Any, that's easier. I like that. <laughs> any opposed? People are fighting lips. <laughs> <laughs> let, the, let the minutes reflect that this group made a decision. <laughs> 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 Thank you. And we said we I said we weren't good at that. Let's see how that could go. Appreciate it. Thank you. But, but now to close it out though, what I understand is you're gonna make some changes and you will send out to the group the the cleaned up. Okay. For day. And I see um uh Don Stryker has his hand raised there, Don. I, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, that was so 2020 of me, huh? To forget to mute, unmute. Um, I, I just had a quick question. This may seem way off base, but some of the feedback that we're getting already just in our scoping has to do with um, moving bears to wilderness, right? And the wilderness community is uh, very um, um, active in making sure that we pay attention to the issue of not using helicopters to relocate into wilderness areas, and particularly if there's other options available. Um, and I didn't know if that was something that could be a piece of this um, genetic augmentation um, 
um, criteria or best practice document um, if we wanted to make some kind of statement about that. And I'm not I'm not um, advocating for or against now. I'm just sort of sharing out that um, that that may be a concern that a, a, that a different user community has. I think on all on all of our forests and parks. Yeah. Yeah, you know, from my perspective, is we we didn't get down to that level of this type of place or that type of place. But my assumption is is if we were we were contemplating we're gonna we need to move a bear, we would work with the land management agency and. But they would have to make right. them follow any yeah. policies. Yeah. Like, well, you know, if it's non-emergency, it takes a regional forester to approve it. Right. And. Uh, Probably would be an emergency. No, that's <laughs> yeah. part. Of, yeah, you should have said that. Part of this, the reason for this document is to point out this isn't something we're going to do next week. It, it does require planning and coordination, okay. and you know, even you know, one of the questions that came up with the NCD is how are we going to do this? Mm -hmm. You know, and our agency's committed that you know, if we do it, we would take the lead of doing that. But okay. we're not going to get a trapping crew going and lining things up until we know, you know, that the Forest Service and Park Service said, yes, they can go here. And that would all be, you know, probably, you know, six to 12 months ahead of time. This is great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Ken. So again, yeah, so that was, uh, <laughs> sent to us from both the GYE and the NCDE subcommittees. And um, thanks for, for moving that forward. Um, again, just to provide that assurance um, that, that was, uh, you know, then look part of the strategy going forward. But, and that, that does carry weight with the subcommittee supporting it and all those folks. I mean, that does carry some some weight for consideration. So something to note. And yeah, I mean, and those of us who attend those meetings have already Heard it and ask oh, questions yeah. and go people should carry some way. Okay. okay, so the next presentation, you you got Lori's presentation. Right. You, you got Lori's presentation oh, earlier um, <laughs> from the Information Education Outreach uh, Subcommittee, which is you know as she talked about, she's got a committee of committee of subcommittee leaders that make up that larger IEO subcommittee, and that she's now looking you know, and, and supporting projects across the range. Um, and we we have had we've been we've been fortunate uh, in this grizzly bear world to have you know, really some of the world some world class science um, from multiple agencies and states. Um, and you know, and it, but it has developed sort of, you know, ecosystem by ecosystem. And so at the at the executive meeting in July, uh, as we were having these strategic discussions, the question of have the science team leads come together in the way that the IEO team leads have? And um, that's the question that Frank is going to uh, answer as best as he can at this moment here. That's right. That's why it's called the prequel. <laughs> I've watched too many TV shows, apparently. <laughs> First of all, Matt, I want to point out that Bozeman delivered on your, yeah. your nice weather. So. We were lucky. <laughs> I was wondering what that big yellow orb in the sky was. He's never seen it in my family. We call it the sun around here. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I will note tonight, everyone does need to look up because it's the winter moon and this is the shortest day. And so there's a whole bunch of astral or I don't know, whatever you want to call them, things happening tonight. So as well as the sun, we offer the moon. To you, Matt. So just to <laughs> <laughs> it is, yeah. It's, it's a big close to the winter. Season. Yeah. So so there you go. I've been trying for when I was chair, I tried for years to move out of the, the winter meeting out of Missoula and could never get it done because there were too many detractors and somehow Jack and finally got it done. And, and I bought you uh sixteen year old like a bull in last night. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, go go back, Frank. Get us back on track. Okay. Yep, no problem. The prequel. Uh, next slide. So you you've seen this uh, this map before, but I think it's it's very relevant to what we're talking about here. And as and and David introduced it perfectly. Um, you know, we've we for a long time science has happened within the different ecosystems, 
But we are now in a, in a place where if you look at the diagonal um, map portions, those are occupied range. And then in recent years, the, the Fish and Wildlife Service has taken the lead on with data from the, the different ecosystems has taken the lead on mapping this what we call maybe present uh, area that's based on uh, hydrological units. And so when you look at it, obviously there's a lot of, and those are, those are verified uh, obs observations of grizzly bears in those uh, huts. And um, and so when you look at this this map and you look at the where the, where the parks are, there's the core areas in, in the blue uh, outlines, and then the, the recovery zones in, in yellow, we see that you know we've obviously expanded well beyond the recovery zones uh, in, in the Yellowstone and uh, NCDE and, and uh, also stuck in Canada. Yeah, and, and South Birds. And we have a lot of um, verified observations uh, in between. And so this is why this is probably a good time to stand up this, this new science committee, IGBC science committee, because there is a, a maybe a, a place where IGBC really can make a difference is in some of these areas in between. And so that is kind of the, the thought behind this. Um, next slide. I want to take you back to uh, to two previous presentations uh, that we worked on uh, for our GBC meetings in the past in 2018 at the Polson meeting. We kind of first broached this topic, and then uh, last year um, we had another presentation, really talking about uh, you know, cross ecosystem science and going to look just a brief summary of that. You know, the, I, I guess some of the takeaways from that work was that the science approaches do differ within the different ecosystems. That's partially because of historical reasons. You know, the study team was established in, in, in for the Yellowstone ecosystem in 1973. Um, Captain Jack, I think, started doing their monitoring program in the early 80s, 1983, and then the official monitoring program. And, and you know, there's a lot of other research being done in those ecosystems too, but the official monitoring program in the NCD started in 2004. And so there's different contexts. Um, you know, we tend in Yellowstone, we tend to focus on monitoring females with cubs because we have a lot more open habitat. We can do so pretty efficiently and effectively. That's a lot harder in places like the NCD and Cabin Jack and so forth. So there's historical, practical, and, and also some scientific reasons for why there's different approaches. And um, next slide. The role that worked when, when we looked at, at how did the teams work together, you know, a couple of important conclusions. There's really good communication between the science teams and the, the subcommittees. They work within each ecosystem. They work together really well. Um, I also, you know, over, over time, we have worked well among, among the science teams as well. Um, but we also came to the conclusion, I think, that that there are challenges to a, a one science fits all approach. You know, there was, um, and Toby brought this up uh, a couple of years ago. You know, should should we be thinking of something like an IGBSD plus that where we where we kind of standardize approaches across the different ecosystems? And I think that's a challenge uh, for for a number of reasons. Um, but I do think there's a need and there's opportunities for more cross ecosystem science. Next slide. Mm -hmm. So, just a little uh, uh, picture of the past, um, where we fit in the past. You know, in, in the subcommittee structure in 1991 was actually quite different than what we have now. I mean, we have basically uh, three subcommittees for the ecosystems. You know, that was the Yellowstone, NCDE, and then everything else was combined in Northwest. And we had a separate research subcommittee at a time as well as an IE committee. Um, just wanted to, to, to remind you of that because sometimes we lose this this type of history. Next, so I, you know this is when when Toby brought up this, you know to restructure the IGB science as well. Um, the conclusion from from my end and, and talking to a lot of other people uh, on the other science teams is that that would require a major organizational realignment. Uh, would also require different funding mechanisms that, that would be really difficult to do when we actually have a system that I think works pretty well. 
the science that occurs in each of the ecosystems is good science that, that informs good decision making. So the alternative, um, you can click it again because I've got a little check mark. This is what we basically decided on. Um, was the, the alternative to the idea of, of you know, an IGPC working group was discussed at the 2018 meeting. Um, the, the alternative to, to that would be to establish and stand up a, a new committee. And so there is the, the IGPC Science Committee. Next slide. And so these are the, the current to be members of this committee. We're, we're meeting tomorrow for the first time officially. And the idea behind the membership here was to get all the science leads for the different ecosystems. There's a the bit of ecosystem, there's um, two co chairs, so that's why there's two folks from, from that ecosystem, as well as Hillary, because she's the recovery coordinator, and it makes sense that Hillary is, is involved in this uh, science committee as well. So these are the, the members of the, of the science committee. Go ahead. And we will meet tomorrow. And basically, these are the, the, the main agenda items that we, we will have um, for discussion tomorrow. You will we'll define what our role should be, how, how can we best serve uh, you as an executive uh, committee, um, how do we best function as a science committee. And then I think that the most important one is to really start thinking about you know, what are some of the overarching science needs across ecosystems and uh, that I think uh, will be really I look forward to that discussion it will be a great discussion just as a, a reminder you know we're, we're not just this is not something that that is entirely new you know we have as I mentioned we have been collaborating uh, with science teams across the different ecosystems and there's a couple of ongoing efforts that that are worth pointing out um, that really relate to cross ecosystem science. Um, you've heard quite a bit about integrated population models over the last couple of years. That's an ongoing effort um, that I mentioned, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more towards the end here. But um, in Yellowstone, I think we're close to starting the, the implementation of that. Uh, NCDE is still working on some some tweaks of the, the models, but hopefully we can we can get that. To work as well, and, uh, and and it would be great if eventually Cam and Jack could uh, could join us, uh, could join in on our effort as well, because it's really designed to be ultimately a multi ecosystem uh, approach. Over the years, we've also done, uh, especially in, in recently, with some some new efforts, uh, cross ecosystem work on. Connectivity and habitat mapping. Uh, in 2017, uh, we looked at um, with the Peck et al. paper. We looked at uh, male connectivity for for uh, male movements uh, between primarily the NCDE and, and GYE. And more recently, uh, with the efforts from uh, from Cecily Costello and, and Sarah Sells, who is a postdoc uh, working uh, with, with Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks at the University of Montana, to First, it's, it's a bigger project that started with mapping of uh, habitat resource selection, habitat uh, within the NCDE. But then the next stage was to see, well, can you apply those models uh, to other ecosystems and, and, and can you get reliable results? And, the, and the, it looks like uh, when Sarah tested that on, um, on for example, the Yellowstone ecosystem, that those results from an NCDE-based model were actually pretty reliable. So in the future, that means that we may not need to, to develop models for each separate area. Uh, we could actually use data from other ecosystems to make habitat prediction. The next stage of, of that project will be to, to look at uh, connectivity areas uh, within the broader region. So that that is involving uh, the different ecosystems. Then there's a bunch of miscellaneous studies. Uh, I just kind of made a put a list together. There's, there's more than this, but these are some of the, the main ones that are ongoing and, uh, and just being started. Um, Cecily and Gloria have been looking at uh, Denning and, and Milan Vinks, I think, is involved too. We the Denning chronology and detecting uh, births from uh, activity data, and those are from a research and science perspective, those are really important 
questions to ask. Uh, think about denning chronology and climate change, for example. Um, we're working together um, and also with uh, folks on the polar bear, the Fish and Wildlife Service polar bear program, to see if we can detect the presence of cubs uh, with from female movement data. You know, they move differently than, uh, especially early in the year, than, than other uh, sex and age classes. And can we detect that they actually have cubs with them? That, that would be really valuable if we can uh, say so with, with uh, pretty high reliability based on our movement data and activity data. Um, as you heard uh, yesterday, um, Fish and Wildlife Service is, is leading projects uh, with Brian Palmer, right? Is it? Um, on contaminant profiles, uh, I think there's going to be samples submitted from different ecosystems for that. Uh, that will provide kind of a, a baseline uh, of, of contaminants in, in, uh, in grizzly bears. And we're working with um, several of the ecosystems are working with um, scientists at uh, Washington State University, um, Ellie Armstrong and uh, Joanne Belly, um, yep. sci scientists, uh, geneticists with Washington State University uh, to develop uh, whole, whole uh, species genomics for grizzly bears. And that will be a really, um, that will provide high quality genetic profiles that um, that do not quite exist yet and also has potential to make genetic sampling in the future much, much cheaper than what's, uh, what it is now. So there's lots of potential there as well. And of course, the, the maybe present mapping is a cross-ecosystem effort that I think has been uh, very, very important to understand and to, to really be proactive and, and Try to get a sense of okay, where can we expect bears to, to show up next? Besides the connectivity model that we have, that's the most direct information we have from verified uh, observations. So with that, I wanted to um, give the executive committee maybe an opportunity to, as we we stand up this new committee, um, you know, our are there suggestions right now of, of uh, what you identify maybe as overarching issues that, that would be worthwhile for us to, to contemplate uh, tackling in the future? And I think we still have to kind of figure out how this is going to work, right? You know, I mean, we, we already have full plates for each of the science teams on, on for our sub subcommittee work. And so I'm struggling a little bit with an idea of um, being tasked with additional things to to you know, for combined analyses, cross ecosystem analyses, or should we uh, let it happen more naturally as as has mostly happened so far? We we are collaborating and doing things, um, working together on on topics that we think are relevant to you. But but if they're not, then we should we should know that too, I guess. So um, I just want to quickly open up uh, the opportunity for you to. To reflect on that before I say a couple of things about the specifically to the Yellowstone ecosystem on the demographic workshop. One thing I've been thinking about is that you know, we have the ecosystem, the subcommittees, I mean, all kind of we should be doing this and we should be doing this. And it seems like a role of this group you're talking about might be to sort of vet proposals. Um, you know, make sure it's doing what you want it to do and not this one over here is not going to undermine something over here and that kind of thing. That makes sense? Yeah, and so you're you're talking specifically about mm -hmm. proposals that would come from the subcommittees or because um, and the reason I'm asking is we also get a lot of requests for data from external yeah. entities. Um, those always go through an in Internal review with like, and I know Cecily does the same thing, but within within the IGBSD, we we go through a, a review process to see if, if this is something that we want to collaborate on. But you're talking about proposals that come from within the subcommittee structure. Yeah, I I agree. I, I think that's uh, that that would certainly be a, a useful task for this committee for the for the science leads to really look at. Can I question about that? I mean, each agency also, IGBC has goals, each agency has goals, and they're not always the same. So, how do you see that going? Well, it makes me think about it. A few years ago, several years ago, Adam Yak, when he said, We should do a 
air work to capture air snare project. Uh, and we had no we just the parts in the tag for like six hundred thousand dollars in that. and the science level, my my understanding at that point it was nobody felt it was really necessary. And you know, Wayne had a pretty good idea somewhere between 48 and 50 bears in the ecosystem. Right? Spend a million dollars to say right, there's 49 bears in the ecosystem. Uh, I still remember one of our IGC meetings was over we're in a parking lot at the, at the outhouse in Yellowstone and that's the big, big back and forth about how, well, how should this work? And it just, again, it seems like just because the Academy Act says, yeah, this is really important. Uh, Range-wide level, it's yeah, more than what. Yes, yeah. I mean, there, there's, it could be a little bit challenging sometimes because I, I think the committee would should really only look at those proposals from a purely scientific perspective. Can can goals be accomplished? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it it would be up to the science committee to determine is that a is that a real, is that a good goal. That should be up to the subcommittees to decide. It, I think, but but we can look at. At the scientific value and the scientific methods being proposed, and what we could that that is a different type of review than is it is it worth doing because that's that's more of a value judgment. That comment that so we're working in a world of very limited resources, and we have a lot of information needs, and so. I can see the subcommittees and this committee playing a very important role in helping prioritize the information needs. But I would be really concerned about us entering into an arena where it was where there must be the appearance that we're suppressing science, that there's an interest, there may be a broader public interest in pursuing the science. And my my bureau has the, the goal of advancing science. And um, so I just think we need to be careful about that. We need to be careful about um, a perception that we're avoiding science that we're afraid of. For some reason. We should be embracing science. We should be embracing That's science. It should be the basis. We right? should be, yeah. It's just, it's just science. It's just information. So. Yeah. And if, you know, if there's a broader public interest in a body of science, certainly from the USGS perspective, we have a responsibility to respond to that. Um, but, but again, I'll I'll circle back to we also have limited Limits. capacity yeah. because of limited funding, just limited resources, and so we don't want to spend all of our time and resources doing work if we're totally missing the most important points of this community, but we have a we have a a line to navigate there. Yeah, so that's that to me is helpful um, information for our meeting tomorrow that we'll have with the, with the science committee. Yeah. Frank will will consider that and report back to you of course. I just want to make so the history here of the close connection between the science teams and the needs of the of the subcommittees the types of information that the subcommittees needed. So I know you're about to talk about Yellowstone and, and the demographic monitoring as a specific need to yep. support their decision making. Um, but I guess the the I'm interested in for this committee and its decision making needs and um, sort of this executive dashboard concept. Each subcommittee, you know, the, you've got science reports for Yellowstone, for NCBE, for Selkirk and Cabinet Yak. And those are given, those are presented at those subcommittee meetings. And I don't know that we have had sort of a, a, a synthesis or summary um, of what do we know, you know, what, what, what is all that we know? And maybe that's not a, a, a reasonable request, um, but it is, you know, it's, it, 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 how do you efficiently share the, share what we have learned? So you're, you're saying maybe there's a need for kind of a high level uh, summary of status and trend yeah. for the for the entire level 48. I, it's, a, it's a question that yeah. you might consider. 
Uh, and then another th th thing I just want to highlight is, you know, you, you gave a number of examples where science team members are already working across the larger landscape. And the decision this group just made to approve that genetic augmentation paper, it included input from, you know, yeah. people that you're, you know, we, we are using the scientists, you know, to, to inform decisions, yeah. which is. Yeah. yeah, so a lot of, I, again, a lot of good stuff is already going on. Uh, this this committee more or less kind of formalizes something that. Just another uh, if part of your question was, does this committee and councils around the table have ideas for future research that maybe could apply across multiple ecosystems? I put out some of the questions we've heard in some of the subcommittees relative to non motorized recreation effects that there's any you know, old data that exists. Um, there's published information, but you know, is that the state of the art? You know, what do we know now? And can we be more uh, you know, deliberate in some of the questions we're asking now? Um, maybe the same goes with some of the road density um, questions, you know, standards we have now. And are those still the best science? In, in, you know, I, there's been recent science on that, but um, kind of just making sure we're up to date on, on that. And with the, that's that's something that I hear a lot about within the Forest Service and probably some of the land managers. And certainly in our Section 7 world, we hear about that a lot too. So what's going on with that? I just want to cut back to your, your point, which I thought was really good one about the fact that you already have full plates. And as we talk tomorrow about the presence of the community, about what's so overarching priorities might be. Um, and that could layer on more things. I think that's a really important consideration. But I, I like what I think I heard you say, Claudia, is that that there's an identification of priorities that informs then what each individual subcommittee is looking at as their scientific activity. Right? Is that the intent or is that sort of to be determined? So I think that's a, that's a good model. In terms of from my perspective, that's to be determined. Okay. I think that's that's what our discussion tomorrow should be uh, should include in on other topics. Yeah. So I think again, I'll just say it. I think you know this new committee identifying the virtual priorities that are then for consideration as the subcommittees look at what they're what they're going to identify. It's, it's and again, it comes comes back to you know the, the, the notion of uh, how can this committee, which within the constraints of we all have, how can we best serve the science committee? How can we best serve you as an executive? That's what it boils down to for me. Yeah, yeah and that that point seems like with the subcommittee structure and the science subcommittees in the ecosystem subcommittees, right? There's this interface between the policy questions, the management questions, and then the science that is generated to help answer those questions. And do we have that same structure already built into this with the executive committee and the new science committee? And do we have that sort of that interplay? Maybe not quite because we're just forming it, right. right? But there will be, I think, a need for this committee to have those conversations about what are those priorities, those main right priorities, so that that to and the science policy interface. Exactly. That's uh, that's that's really critical. And I think that we have great examples from subcommittees on how well that works. So I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that we can get to something that works for for this committee as well. Rest of time for a couple of minutes. Um, just just a quick update um, because it came up yesterday. I, I want to make sure that that you folks are, are aware of this too. And I just I think I have four or five slides on this. So go ahead, Lori. Um, we uh, in November uh, we held a, a demographic workshop, and that was really the result of several tasks from the Yes Committee, and that. That was in, in turn was a was a result of some of the updates that were being made to the chapter to the demographic chapter of the conservation strategy. So with those tasks, uh, we we set out to organize this, this workshop um, with the two first objectives being the primary 
staff from, from yesterday. And then in addition, we, we identified several other objectives. So the, the first one was to review demographic data and update viral rates. And when I say viral rates, that refers to things like survival rates, reproduction, uh, sex ratio, that sort, sort of thing that we need to estimate population size. Um, update the demographic parameters and estimates in the, in, in the conservation strategy. And then the, the third and fourth objectives were really to look at our ability of the monitoring program to detect changes in population trends over time. And the key uh, objective really was also the, this fourth one there to, to kind of do a, a final evaluation of the integrated population models um, as, uh, as potentially primary demographic monitoring tool for us in the future. So some preliminary outcomes. Um, you know, in the past, we, we've summarized and, and estimated vital rates for distinct periods of time. That sometimes causes some, some challenges because, um, you know, if you're at the end of the uh, time period, your, your data are becoming a little bit outdated. So um, we're, we're moving towards this idea of, of kind of a, a, using a 15 year moving window of, of data and update so you look 15, you use data from 15 years back all the way up to the current day to, to inform your, your estimates of survival, reproduction, all that. Um, and you move that window up every every year. And that's that is a I think a much better way to approach it. In the past, we couldn't do that because of just the data limitations and the efficiency limit. It took us forever in the past to, to update all the data to to do that on an annual basis. Now uh, with with different programming tools that we have available and uh, and search we, we can actually do that so um, by looking at those at those rates um, reproduction survival you know, we, we saw some some interesting trends uh, some remain very steady like adult female survival which is the most critical parameter has been incredibly constant for four decades it's basically around 0.94 so that means every year 94 out of 100 adult females survive um, and that's that's been incredibly constant and and critical for the recovery. Um, some other things uh, like like cup survival uh, show some trends, and we're we're seeing more evidence uh, in addition to what we've already doc documented in the past of density dependent effects, where in areas with higher bear densities we're seeing lower cup survival. And we think that's that is based on observations and other data you know, that that is probably related to males killing uh, cubs in, in areas where densities of bears are just high. So it also points to biological recovery, you know, so that, that points to reaching carrying capacity in, in many portions, especially in the core of the ecosystem. Then the final point, um, you know, we, we are getting pretty close to the implementation of, of the IPM. The next slide. That's the last one. Um, and just on that, on those integrated population models, um, we talked a little bit about that before. But what they do is basically integrate all the data sources into a single unified system, and that that makes the best use of all your data. Your data have to to talk to each other and have to uh, match each other, so to speak. Uh, which in the in the past we did all this kind of in separate data streams and separate estimates that may not always reconcile with one, one another with, with the integrated population models. They are designed to, to talk to each other and, um, and, and match each other, so to speak. And that improves the estimates. And of course, that's important for decision making. So we started that in 2018, and I think we're, we're ready to, to start implementing it in, in 2023. Again, so we're not just jumping into that. This is taking a lot of evaluation. Um, we're preparing a publication for peer review journal. I think it's important to, to support uh, your decision making. And you know, the implementation of this will require some additional uh, and further revisions to the conservation strategy. But I want to point out that this would essentially be fundamentally, it's, it's an extension of, of what we currently do. It wouldn't change the, the type of data that we collect, it would just make better use of all the data combined. Uh, and more efficient use, and potentially in the future, that means we could drop some some data collections and focus more on others that that are more valuable for, for estimation of population and trend. 
and so that might uh, enhance some of our efficiencies in, in the future as well. So bottom line is it allows for a more reliable, more unifying and flexible monitoring and, and management framework. It's really well designed for the notion of adaptive management. And uh, so um, you know, we've reported to the subcommittees on this. We've reported to IPM to, to you as well in the past. And uh, I think we're, we're ready to, to jump on it. So any questions about that? It's exciting. So again, this goes back to my appreciation for what y'all are doing. Um, what I shared yesterday, uh, it's going to be critical for us to be able to move forward. Really appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thanks, thanks, Frank. So we'll hear more uh, at our next meeting about how, what the discussions have been and, and, and where you go with that. Yeah. Um, so we've got um, a little less than 30 minutes until we have advertised a public comment, which is an important part of our meetings. Uh, I want to take that time to make as much progress as we can um, on this question of fair smart. Um, and maybe what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to stand up, go to the front, and just try to um, recap. The work that's taken place on this since we met in July. So, uh, Lori gave a presentation on the work of the Bear Smart Working Group. She gave you the list of the folks that had been involved in that, and their work basically ended around then. That's they had put together all these materials. Um, but when it was brought to the executive committee, the executives raised some really good questions about what would it mean for IGBC to adopt this concept of Bear Smart, um, and so. Uh, the, the executive committee formed a small group, and that small group met um, on November 3rd, and it was uh, it included our chair, Jackie Buchanan, Ken McDonald from Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, Matt Hogan from Fish and Wildlife Service, and Jennifer Carpenter from the Park Service. And there, we were trying to remember the, the executive conversation in July. One of the issues raised was the geographic um, uh, distribution of, of the program, you know, wh where are we talking about for being bear smarter? And we wanted to be able to clearly communicate that we are not talking about Colorado. Um, you know, this is the, the, the states of the IGBC. Um, and so the, you know, we, we you know, tried to think of ways to, to um, make that, to communicate that and make that clear. Uh, initially, we, we thought of maybe a map, but then the map also was uh, potentially confusing. Um, and so, you know, really kind of came down on the idea of uh, and I guess I should say, we, we met as a small group who were, were endorsing the, pro the idea of moving forward. And then we also had further discussions um, with uh, Ed Schriever and Jim Fredericks from Fish and Game and uh, Rick King and, and Dan Thompson and Kyle Garrett, who was on the Bear Smart Group from Wyoming Game and Fish. So we've talked it through um, amongst those executives and we're bringing forward today sort of a, you know, an attempt to try to answer these questions and to give you some options of a way forward. So. Um, Rather than a map uh, uh, to indicate where might you be eligible to, to, to come into this program, the thought was that that would actually be handled uh, locally by uh, states, by the spare, spare specialists on the front line or the designated um, contact um, of the state agency, sort of in the way that it does now. Um, and, and that was that was one idea for for and, and also that we can make it clear that we're really talking about occupied grizzly bear range. Um, for, for this program. So then the second question that, you know, when we looked at the British Columbia program, one feature of their program was you form your committee, you do your assessment, you write your plan, and then the province um, looks at it all and maybe gives you a, 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 a recognition of, in some form. And that was a source of discussion in July, and then again in the small group, and there were some concerns about that idea. Um, the the um, one concern with it is that this idea that we heard this morning that you're never done, you're never actually finished. Um, you know, this is a dynamic set of issues, and and uh, there's always um, you know things are changing. Uh, and then the second uh, second point you know, in the British Columbia program, there are actually right now only ten communities that have that formal recognition, um, and 
you know, it is a big lift to do go through all of those steps. And so there was a concern that we didn't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. Uh, and we don't want a community to think I can't do the first thing because I'm not going to do all 10 things or all 100 things. Um, so the the um, and, and, and again, the other concern here was this idea of just like in the product testing program. We don't ever say bear proof. We discourage the idea of bear proof. There's no such thing as bear proof. Um, and so, you know, the part of the making sure we're, we're being clear about what what being bear smart or, or aware means. Um, so and then the, the third topic that was raised in July and then discussed in the small group was, you know, what is the staff commitment? You know, if the IGBC is saying, hey, communities, we want you to go down this road. Uh, what what are we committing to uh, as agencies in terms of supporting that? And, you know, the reality is that our specialists are already being contacted in, in many places from by communities that are trying to, to get ahead of conflicts. Um, so in some places it might make sense, uh, uh, um, and in other places it may not. And again, that's where the, the on-ramp being determined uh, locally may be helpful. Um, so what I have for you is sort of a, a, a two options. Um, you know, the, 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 the framework, that we have, you heard some references to this morning, is this is not, the work is not done by state or federal agencies. The work is being done by community. We're trying to incentivize communities to take these things on. They form the committee, they do the assessment, they write the plan. We may be able to connect them with resources, uh, you know, with examples, with contacts, with experts, um, but it's it, you know, we're, we're trying to step back and let the communities move out. Um, and so, uh, you know, so that's so the framework is. You know, very simple, it's communities form a, a, a committee, communities do an assessment, communities do uh, an implementation plan and then. Um, what's the last one? And then implement. Oh, implement the plan and then. There is this option of seek recognition from whatever um, body may be willing to do that. Um, and that could be a state agency or it could be uh, a nonprofit or, um, you know, but it seems like it's not going to be the IGBC um, based on the discussions that we've had. So again, let me make this simpler again. So two options. One option is no further action by the IGBC on Bear Smart. Um, we've got the materials. We can give them to some to people of interest, but we're not going to um, sort of endorse this framework as something that we encourage people to, to follow. The second option is that we do endorse the framework. It's something that as their experts, as agencies um, that are in, that are, are standing, you know, in, 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 that are, are members of these communities and, and on the front lines, see the value to it and want to endorse uh the, the concepts um and so therefore we would publish the framework um publish some of these materials that can be used as templates or examples um and uh, you know there's i've now got three sub options in the endorse the bear smart framework option so the first is we just do that um you know on the bear on the on, the, on our website right now we have universal ieo messages we have um, a list of bear resistant containers, and we would also have, the, oh, by the way, you can do this. If you want to do these steps, here's how to do a, a, a it, this framework is one we recommend. Um, second variation of the do, endorse the bear smart community framework is to um, you know, do the same, publish those materials, um, and then you, you know, it, it'll, it'll allow the option for each state to uh, potentially you know, have an on ramp for you're eligible and then, on the, and then an off ramp at the end for we're going to provide recognition. Um, and a variation of that is the third option, which is that. Um, we, we, we right now have this bear smart working group and the, we could keep that, you know, it's been an offshoot of the IEO committee. Um, but. We heard the need, you know, the communities are looking for not reinventing the wheel and being able to be put in contact with other communities. And so if we had a bear smart working group, that could be a, a place that information is shared. We could collect 
act, sort of actively collect and post templates, pieces of information that are coming from communities. Um, and so again, let me go through these. So no action, we're done. Or endorse a framework by just posting the framework and saying it's something that we endorse. Or endorse the framework and then states can decide internally what to do uh, to support that framework. Or third, endorse the framework and keep our working group together um, that can be um, accessed by communities that are looking for information to move down this road. So I hope I haven't confused everybody, <laughs> but I, I think that's where we are. I have Matt and then Jennifer. Oh, question for you, David. So uh, to be, and to be is when each state decide how that game will engage with the formal recognition. And then 2C says keep the working group together and share best practices with it. Would 2B, if we went with 2C, would 2B be part of that? Does that question make sense? So, so would the state still play a role in that, even though the working group is still being stood up? So maybe this is where I stop, and I and we let's hear from the states in particular. Um, Rick King from Wyoming. The Fairwise program has been in existence for many, many years. There's long-standing relationships with communities. We're not trying to add confusion or add layers. Um, so, Rick, what I've heard from you is you're not looking for uh, uh, you know, any formal recognition or, or, or further action on that. But is how about the idea of the framework? What do you think of that for Wyoming? Yeah, <clears throat> the framework is is great, and we fully support that. And I think it's important that there's a centralized location for communities to get information. It's this information that's it's very well done, very well thought out, and very beneficial. Um, but the concern, like we've expressed, is just that uh, there still needs to be a strong tie back to the state agency um, for communities. And in terms of ITBC taking on any kind of a recognition or certification program, that just doesn't make sense. I, I think that would be a wouldn't be a wise road for ITBC to go down until. So we don't support that. Okay. So basically, we support all the way through 2B and deep into 2C, but not to the very last period of it. <laughs> okay. Um, that's helpful, I think. Uh, uh, Jennifer, I don't know if you do it. Yeah, it may be moot now, but um, <laughs> uh, the we had talked about uh, way back a coordinator position because of the potential workload, but that's probably only if we were in a certification role. So that's, I think, off the table at this point. And so this would just be a working group that has a collateral duty of assisting communities in achieving the, the program objectives, if you will, or something to that effect, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Rick, can I ask you some questions? I just want to make sure I heard you. Right. So you said, 2C, 2B, and 2C all the way through the last clause. It's a, I think you said last paragraph, but it, I'm looking at the summary on page three that just says and advise on any recognition decision. So that's that, that's, that's basically that what you cross off, right? Deleted. Yeah. So strike that. So we would we would collect templates and materials on the IPBC website. Period. So the only thing is, I just wasn't sure if Montana or Washington would still want to maybe pursue that. Um, and that's why it, it sort of was not as, as you know, precise as it could be. Uh, and yeah, no, I think um, I, I kind of compare this to the container testing. And there's, to me, there's real value to that, that certification. Anybody could say I'm very just this this implies there's there's something behind it. So I I'm actually an advocate of you know if this is going to be a, an ATDC program then then we make it a program and we stand behind it. we help promote it we help communities implement it which gets back to you got to have a some staff to do that. So would that be the working group? I, I don't think. It's similar to what we've heard with the science and everything else. They already have full time jobs. So if if we're gonna do
HDBC sponsored airwise community program. We should be a resource to help these communities and other people, some focused staff people. Yeah, in our state, you heard this morning, you know, Missoula. So we got the same thing going on at Gardner and their Lodge and Bozeman. I mean, it's, that's, there's a ton of work being spent in a reactive mode right now in all of these communities that are up in or on the fringe of bear habitat. This, the, the, this approach seems to me like a way to get a way bigger bang for the buck than one guy going out and responding to the bear that up to the trash cans. And so, so I'm an advocate of 2C with, with actually a, you know, an enhanced role of like, and maybe we'll actually help them. And okay, just to, to clarify that, that, so that enhanced role would, would take on what is described as a state role in the two the engagement. Yeah. 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 And again, I think about all the discussions we've had on the container program, and Craig went wrong, but it always seems that the limitation, or one of the limitations for a long time was there's no staff to actually implement. So Scott was kind of trying to do it, we got Patty doing a little bit, we finally got it sort of working. And then, and then the question becomes, if you have staff, you got to pay them how to do that. Think again about analogy with the container program. At one point, we sort of self assessed ourselves to some funds to some kind of higher people. I know I'm not a state here. Um, we did work through some funding scenarios when we were sort of down that track. So we generally have an idea of what that coordinated might like, cost. And we have a description. And we have a description, we just so people know that we have that information. Well, and so I want to separate this concept of staff support from the idea of recognition. Because when we talk to British Columbia, it's it's people, the communities are looking for, for sort of information and, and support and contact at multiple phases of the process. It's not just at the end. Um, and in fact, you know, the letter itself may not be the most important thing. It's more the, you know, the, the, the technical experts are standing behind us and, and we know that we're on the right path, um, you know, with, as they make you know, potentially you know, very significant investments um, for their communities. So um, if we take any of these option two options where we're endorsing a framework, it's going to be the, the bear managers that get phone calls, um, sort of regardless of whether we're offering recognition at the end or not. Um, and so you mentioned, you know, that there are a lot of communities doing this already. Um, so I just, I, you know, that's just sort of what's happening right now. Um, and, you know, so, so, the, so the staff is, and right now, and again, it's, it, is that, it is agency by agency, specific geography by specific geography. The working group, you know, at least it had some sharing of information across landscapes and, um, oh, did you see what they're doing over here? Um, and opportunities for templates and things of that nature. But you know, I don't think there's a, you know, there's a recognition, it doesn't sound like, based on the conversations with a small group, I don't know that we have any kind of consensus that it would be a letter with IGBC letterhead. There could be a letter with FWP letterhead. Um, uh, but I, in talking with some of the communities, it sounds like maybe the letter isn't actually a, a make or break as much as the, when we, sure. When we start uh, at every step, we can check in and, and, and test uh, this. This is good, good information both sides. And, and that it's endorsed, if you will, by IGBC. That was the, the headline. Yeah. So and that again, yeah, option one is do not endorse. Option two is endorse. And if you endorse, it will create expectations. But, uh, but there's a difference between endorse and certification, mm -hmm. and and that's. That's, I mean, to say we support and recognize, mm -hmm. and it is different than we support or we certify. You've got a gold seal of certification, and I think that was where there was there was that discussion or concern. I mean, that was part of what Ed had raised uh, his concern with certification, but he could get to 
we support the work and would continue to have have that. And it sounds like in your smaller group, maybe you took certification off the table and it was more about recognition. Yes, the letter or something. The reason for that was the, the potential for misinterpretation. Sure. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's a procedural thing that we're recognizing. You have done the you have you have done, gone through this process. Um, yeah. So can you use the term sponsored? And so and so we're using different terms, uh, certified sponsored endorsed. I, I mean, I see as we bring it here, endorsement as being something that you could do without necessarily saying that it has to result in approval by IGBC. So if if, if I'm more of a, a fan of the model that Rick laid out, that the state can decide where to take it. And the materials are all there. I'm certainly a fan of option two because for all the reasons that we've talked about, hugely valuable. So appreciate all the work that has gone into that and the framework clearly works. So we saw a great example, so that's one. Uh, but Montana could certify in your own way if you wanted to, if you saw the value in that. And in fact, like the, the Virginia City example, there was a there was a logo up there that said very smart community, right? Um, they made their own logo, yes. Okay. That's what started a lot of this new <laughs> group So that was for me to recognize them, or should there be a state or bear professional? It's kind of like, well, there's maybe a need for this interagency because it yeah. across different states and tribal lands. And so, yeah, I guess a big part of the question is how, how important is that to have that endorsement, or do they just want to know, to Jackie's point, that they're doing the right thing? And my sense is that that's largely what people want. They want a framework that will help them secure their community. So, that's, that's but, where I'm in. But a framework that's endorsed by IGBC, not a certification, not a whatever, but that, hey, IGBC says, here are some steps that you can follow to be bear smart, right? So yeah, I think we're sort of talking about the same thing. I agree, right? and, and if you do that, then you are bear smart. You don't get a certification and maybe they get a letter. I, I don't know. I, like I said, I don't know that that's the important thing. The important thing is that they're bear smart. Right, and that IGBC endorses the protocol. Yeah. yeah, and part of this for me is that we have communities, and I know I shared this, that have no grizzly bears that have huge bear problems. And so how does that fit in? How do we steer them to this? Do they get this endorsement? Do we say, no, you go do bear wise instead? It, it, it just gets a little bit messy. So, I, and, and I think that's, again, for every state to, Washington's in the same boat, for every state to figure out, um, how do you steer people? And I think that's another part of this is the training that needs to go to our officers and our, our conflict management people, our biologists, to so that they're very aware of, of this program and then are prepared to work with the communities to make it happen, to facilitate it. So, so I know Hannah's trying to jump in here, but I, I just want to make sure it's important. I want to understand the state's perspective on, on, on these options. So. Jim, are you saying 2B is kind of what you like, let's endorse the framework, then the states handle that with communities who mm -hmm. want to look at it? Yeah, and with the help of NGOs and others, yes, yeah, absolutely. And and I guess, again, like Rick, not to say that I have any objection to the working group continuing on, so it's kind of the 2B slash C okay. minus the endorsement. <laughs> Thanks. Just wanted to clarify. Sorry. No, so from my perspective, it seems like 2A and 2B are really not much different from the IGC approach, right? It's to put this the stuff out there. Um, I, like you, Jim, again, many others agree that the, the work, the framework is a resource that we have and we should. And we all agree that we like it. Um, put it out there for communities to use. Um, the capacity to support implementation is a limiter, right? Um, and we have our a lot of NGO partners that are also doing that work. And so if we have an endorsed thing that's available on the IGB website, that's another resource and another um, validator for communities doing that work. Um, and then uh, the other thing I was thinking about, so Ken, you were saying, you know, sort of to take it all away, and maybe there's some 
we could just take it in baby steps, right? So let's get the framework up there. We, uh, states can do it. And the navigation between the bear wise and the bear smart communities is work for the states, I think. I know that's work for us. Um, and then I I'm a fan of keeping the working group. It seems like there's enough stuff happening here, but I worry about people's capacity. Over tasking. Yeah, yeah. So it sounds like two. So Ken, could you live with two B as at start? I mean, it's better than like just calling it good, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is. It's just I don't know when it's advises and there's a material around the web that's already. Well, I think the commitment with two B is that we are going to hold it, continue to keep it together. So there would be updates if you have the working group. You know, things nothing stays static. I mean, good lord, twenty four hours. It, seems like some things don't stay static. So the 2B plus would be, or 2B would, the plus with 2B would, would be a commitment to at least keep that working group together and, and then maybe evolve. Um, so that's, but, but we would need a motion. That's what you're driving at, right? Yeah, yeah I would like to, one sec, because I'm chairing that working group. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. plus, right? But so I'm I'm having a hard time figuring out if we, I mean I I understand it goes on the website, but then what is, I don't understand what that working group, what what is our function? Then? I mean I really don't. Um, from everything that we've heard from other places, if you don't have someone like actively doing it, it it just it's like what Ken said, it goes on the website and then, you know I'm, I. I don't know, like pulling other people in, but if you had a community that was interested and they come and so do I need to really keep track, start keeping track? Because I, I have had a lot of interest. I can I can probably think of 30 communities from either bear specialists or communities that have come to me and said, oh, we did that, you know, manual that we talked about at the last meeting. And and how does it work, you know, and things like that. And we've kind of said, oh, it's not, you know, it's, it's still a draft. We can't give it out yet because it's not completed. So for me, I mean, and our working group, you know, we do have a couple other tasks we'd like to do. The surveys I talked about, they're not complete yet, but we would only continue those if we're going to be able to get the data back, have someone to use that information. I mean, I, you know, I, so, you know, with the state <laughs> use that information or, or compile that information for us, you know, is that our working group task then to, and then we would share it that way. Um, you know, what kind of workload do I need to finally show that if, if this needs an actual person? I mean, I, you know, I don't, I'm just trying to figure yeah. out then what would my working group actually be tasked with doing? Because um, yeah. we've worked on it a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's a question I had is that, so we, we endorse the framework. It's an IGBC executive committee. That right. makes total sense to me. The working group stays together. They compile information um, from communities that have, that have implemented the framework and have shown success. That all makes sense to me. But then I, I, I worry that going any further is a huge workload. And then you're talking about staff and turning IGBC into something that it really can't be because there's there's no way that one IGBC employee can be a um, a bear smart coordinator across the entire range. That, that it's just unfeasible, and that's why that that work then at that point has to go back to the states to to carry it on. So I guess I'm a little confused about what what your program would be because there's no way unless we hire. 30 people and created a very large organization so we can do much more than getting most of the way through 2C. Yeah, I, I'm just thinking to find the community under this website, okay, fine. Now, who am I going to call to get help? And there's a blank, so no. What could you put, you know, in the lead for each state? So if, if Wyoming's got it in place and you, you've got it, so you know, on our website, it would say for communities within Wyoming, contact X. That was my interpretation of what yeah. 2B is. That's that's kind of what I had in my head. 
um, for that point in time right now. And maybe it would change in the future, but you know, we'd have it to that point, then we'd say for Wyoming, contact this person. Montana, contact. Idaho, contact. Washington, contact. And that, so my, yeah, my point is, Ken, is that if the contact person is an IGPC employee, that there's no way one employee can do that. I mean, listen to all the communities we've heard from today. Everyone is place-based, they're different, they all have unique needs, they all have different players. There's no way one IGPC employee can be the range wide coordinator for fire protection. Yeah, so that's the key. Well, yeah. in my mind, I'm thinking. My, okay. Well, I mean, I kind of just, I kind of disagree just a little bit because I do feel like an overall coordinator would know, you know, contact. It's Missoula, Montana. Here's your local bear specialist. You know, here's the state. The our mind and you know Jennifer when we had that initial working group but the coordinator position was to have someone be a sounding board that knows the program knows how to implement it and knows the people to initiate it in each community or state yeah. and and I and I, yeah I know you have yeah. a lot of reservations yeah. with that but it, to me that just it helps it made guarantees the right word, but foster success in the program. That's kind of what BC because fact. you've got somebody to call or a point of contact, and and I get the point about you can maybe have it by each state, yeah. but um, you know that then that turns the workload again back on the states, and you know we're saying that maybe we could have that one point person to to be that front yeah. coordinator. To assist across the whole area, I, yeah, but I mean, that's going to take money and no, it totally is, and and we we did that is an issue. So um, we have capacity now, and I oh with your NEPA we have new people, and you know I, we've, I've talked with Lori on and off for the last year and a half about this. <laughs> how much time would it take, and yeah, I think probably best to be one full time person, but. We probably can't take one of our people and dedicate it completely, but maybe we could split it and offer, you know, 50-50. We've got conflict staff, and they're pretty busy in the summer, but they have time in the winter. Mm -hmm. And we could tr get those, you know, two of them maybe up to speed to be the go-to, however you want to divide it. We would be very supportive of doing that. And, and again, you know, I was under the assumption, too, it's a little, it was a little confusing to me, but... These, the coordinator role is not taking the place of the agency. You still are, you've got the bear specialist who has the local knowledge, right. who has to be involved. And so the coordinator is a much higher level who knows the program and can uh, advise through the steps of the program, And but you still need the local guy in the ground. Yeah. With that state specific so the referral yeah. service. Well, and yeah, 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 yeah. And I would argue that that's less work for the states to have the court. Yeah, yeah. Because well, the you, you ideally could maybe filter out some that might not. You know, you, you can help them figure out if there truly is a. Uh, you know, they're about to. You know, they're at that point where they're out take off, where they're not really at that point yet, and they have more work to do. So that would almost be a two two B B. To BB. Well, okay. okay. And so, Hillary, would that mean then that your specialist would work with the committee? The working group? Maybe? Yeah, I mean, the working group, sorry. For the, um, yeah, I would think they would have to. Okay, so to sort of be integrated. Yeah. That would be, yeah. Or what do you think about how that would be? I mean, yeah, I, you know, that would, yeah, take off some of the work. I, yeah. They could yeah. do whatever's useful. Mm -hmm. Sure. But I don't want to, yeah, I mean, I think that would be workable, but I, I don't want to take what it, how states feel. So, I, you know, I, I'm trying to be supportive of <laughs> everything. Well, and so am I. I'm trying to just sort of figure out we that way to, to yeah. foster a state to be yeah. successful. Like, we've spent so much time and energy, and yeah. it really does have merit. So how can we launch it mm -hmm. for it to be successful? Yeah, what that's that exactly, mean? yeah. And maybe it's phasing. You know that you know talk about maybe we can maybe we start with this and then yeah. we understand how it works and what are the issues that we need to address. I, I don't know. I'm just sort of thinking out loud. So right. so time check. We're past the point for the public. So yeah. So let me just I'll do the test, Jackie. Um, you know, yeah. Again, it is difficult. You know, this is a large executive body, moving parts in between meetings. You know, this is 
complicated as we've just described. So again, you have sort of two options here. You could just defer completely, maybe try it again tomorrow after some further reflection or push it to a, a future meeting. So you could defer. Which will um, make you cry, but that's um, okay. You, you, <laughs> could, <laughs> you could um you know decide to take no further action option one. Um you could decide to endorse the framework and maybe have some sort of a, a baby steps concept of we're gonna think about we're gonna put the framework up and then whose phone number <laughs> uh Can goes next to it tomorrow. Right. I mean would y'all I, mean, I think we're close. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Think, on it. Yeah. Right. I, but as part of that coming back, can we describe what that two B yeah. B yes. uh, proposal is? Because I think that's an so. And just before we close, it sounds like Hillary's people will negate the need for a coordinator at this point. If we ask permission. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so in between today and tomorrow, or to, yeah, tonight and tomorrow, you can flesh that out. But I think Hillary, we are. Back tomorrow, you know the end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. But I think we're close. I think we're I think we're close. So how about that? Because I don't want to miss the public piece. Yep. But but I really don't. If there's any chance of walking. Okay, so just to make sure though, so so who's going to come back with a motion tomorrow? I'll it's, come back with been, something. It's been you can work a little bit. But I'll ping my friends. Okay. Call a friend. We just split the motion and just at least make a decision today between option one and two, and then tomorrow. What uh, shall we? If my option if it is option two, <laughs> then decide tomorrow what what word you know that option. That sounds like we're moving towards option two. I mean, we're some version of option two B B. Yeah, it just seems like hitting the wording right in the motion. Yeah, yeah. Then option yeah. two. That, That's where we're at. My preference would be since old offer is. In yeah. Job. yeah, that's what I'm thinking of the phone, the friend, we can work on it. Um, OK, so let's let's do that. So, Frank, I think we're there. I mean, and we'll come back tomorrow. Push and pause. OK. And now we're into the public piece. Yeah, so let's see. I've got a couple. Uh, sign ups on the public comment sheet and folks online, if you would raise your hand. Um, yet. to be recognized. Um, so, uh, Kim Johnston, uh, I would recognize you for, for public comment. I just wanted to make a statement of support for you on the of board that we support the IGBC putting forth this very smart community program. Um, we want to offer our help in any way that we can. And so, I just want to let you guys know that we are in support of this and available to Thank you. Thank you. Um, Hannah Raster. Hi everyone, I'm Hannah Brasker. I'm the host of the Yukon Conservation Initiative um, group in Southwest Montana and their habitat and life. Another voice of support for IGBC to move forward this framework. Uh, you heard from a bunch of different groups this morning, groups like Why Why have been working in production space for decades. We worked with a bunch of fire boards and a bunch of different agency partners. To have you guys lead is so important. Your voice is stability for this. Your your voice that doesn't change regardless of board position or strategic plans and NGOs fluctuate. But ITBC is stable. And I just want to really encourage, encourage you guys to adopt the framework. Are there any other uh, folks who wanted to make a public comment that in the room? And then how about online? If you raise your hand or turn your, your camera on so we could see you and recognize you. For the public, this is I this is you have to carry the floor. <laughs> uh, and, and so does the vice chair. Um, you know, this is your opportunity to share with us your thoughts, your concerns, your support, which I really appreciate. And um and, and or concerns, um, you know, we we really are committed to open and public, uh, transparent um, communication, uh, but that has to work both ways. So, okay. you have times I get sent you. Oh, we have one. Thank you, whoever. Okay, uh, Alyssa. Yeah, hi, I'm, my name is Alyssa Chat. I'm with the Great Bear Foundation based in Missoula and also a member of 
the Bear Smart Working Group for Missoula. And I just want to say that Great Bear does support the IGPC taking on this role um, as well. And I also wanted to say a thank you to Jackie for always being sure to include public. That really means a lot to us out here who have voices and contributions as what they may be. But I really do appreciate your constant um, involvement and reminder to the public and the importance of that. So thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, I'm trying to ensure it continues. This group supports it. And um, but we appreciate hearing that from you. Maybe it. <laughs> um, so again, yeah, I, I, um, that was a, that was a big piece of of of, of work. Where in where we've pushed pause, we'll we'll come back to it. Uh, we're very close. Um, so the the plan for tomorrow. Um, I, I've I used to work for an admiral who talked about the liberty list of the things you have to do before you leave the ship. Um, so. We have to come back to this decision. Uh, we have to uh, uh, take a look at the goal statements, both the overarching IGBC goals that are assigned to these committees. So IEO, we're talking about science, maybe something of conflict that Hillary talked about. And then, of course, each subcommittee. And then you have to do your planning as an executive group for, for this coming year in terms of meeting dates and meeting locations, and that includes sort of the, the summer field visit uh, and, and what some opportunities might be there that would advance your the goals that you're setting for yourselves. And the potential working, the five year, is some of that work. Absolutely. That, that needs to happen, could happen. So, you know, in the in the, in the, the, the briefing memo, you got the, 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 the status quo of those documents or those statements are there. And we'll actually, you know, you, you actually heard from the subcommittees, all of them referred to those goals and they told you what their action, their planned actions were. And this is an opportunity to, you know, uh, reflect on those, um, provide any guidance there and, and sort of put it together um, in, in the next step. And again, this has been an iterative process that you've been working on for, for some time. And it is, again, also a challenge because of the sort of uncertainty that Jackie referred to at the beginning of the meeting in terms of where we are right now. Um, in the in sort of the, the regulatory environment. But uh, does, does anyone have other things that they want to make sure we get on the agenda tomorrow morning? Okay, well then. But so, you know, I just want to recognize when I reflect and I look at um, the agenda we had today, I actually am feeling probably more positive and excited because I think we had some we had some really important information sharing. We made some decisions, which God knows I love because it feels like we don't um, often get, sometimes get there. And um, and so we'll drive tomorrow towards getting to a decision around the Bear Smart community and how that's going to look like going forward. Um, you know, the participation, I think folks really stayed with us today. Uh, we heard from some really fantastic partners who are doing some of the critical work that we've identified um, that that we haven't been able to get to or couldn't get to, um, and and so I am I'm feeling more positive and excited uh, than than I have with some of the meetings over the last two years. Part of it's been maybe it's the dynamic of being in person, and I just can't say enough how much. And I hope you, you know those out there in virtual land can be there with us this summer. Um, you do get a different sense. Um, and, and you get a different excitement. I, I want to recognize last night, you know, there's there's importance in being together and having the, the time, you know, in this kind of professional setting. Uh, but there's a value to also being together and sharing um, that that opportunity to to connect at that different level. And and so I, I just want to as I as I really just start to transition out of here. Um, you know, set that up for continuation. Um, and, and you know, for all of you in our exec session, one of the things, and I'll share this with you that I talked about this morning that I hope people carry on is, 
you know, building on develop or continuing to build on, you know, the trust within the executive committee and, and with with our subcommittees. Um, you know, it's easy for things because we are representing different groups and we are representing uh, different perspectives. And, and that's the strength of this group. But it can also be a weakness because it can erode, you know, that that joint of what are we coming together for and why are we doing this work? And and so both internally and externally, um, and so for those of you that weren't with, with us, haven't been with us, um, I just urge all of us to continue to work on that. And and I thought it was fascinating, you know, with the group of folks, the, the four ladies that were there today, and they talked about, you know, the lessons learned and what have they learned, that, that sometimes we have to shut up and listen, Sometimes we have to talk, and, and but we always have to come together and and be willing to be honest. And sometimes there's some vulnerability that comes with that. But but with the sharing and that trust building, um, you gain a lot of ground too. And and that's both internally and externally. So just you know, as I as I think about how to close out um, heading into tomorrow, uh, just urge all of us to to reflect on that and to carry that forward. I think I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks everybody for joining us today, and we'll see you tomorrow morning. We have a, a nine o'clock class. A nine o'clock. Yeah. Thank you.